the media fraternity for accepting our invite and for coming all the way. Um, before we begin, we would just like to like give you a brief introduction about us. Um, we are the volunteers of the Help Naglin Breed campaign. And um, on, a, on a personal level, I am a Kikrimazer. I work at uh, the Department of Planning and Coordination. Uh, this is Apu. He's an administrator uh, and also an entrepreneur. He's the owner of this place as well. This is Lima. She's a development consultant. This is Kezo. She's a lawyer. And that's Alam. And uh, she works at the Child Protection Services. So uh, the Help Naglin Breed campaign is basically a voluntary initiative. It's, we are not really an NGO, but we are just a, a coming together of friends, we would like to call. And um, this was started during the second wave of the pandemic. And uh, during this time, uh, we felt that we, could, uh, we wanted to reach out to our people. And uh, that is how the campaign uh, came about. So Lima will be speaking in detail about um, the campaign. And um, the reason why we have called this press conference uh, is because uh, we have come to a successful end of the campaign. Uh, so we would like to think that the campaign has been successful. And uh, through this press conference, we want to thank our donors, our well-wishers, our support NGOs. And also, this campaign has been a success uh, because of the faith and the trust that uh, all of them have placed in us. So we. Through this platform, we want to um, divulge the information, uh, our financials, the distribution uh, of uh, the medical supplies that has been carried out, um, the the money that came in, how the decision, uh, how we had come to a decision in sending the supplies to different parts of Naglin, and all the uh, the the nitty gritties of our our campaign. Also, we would also like to share about um, our working structure of the campaign, and. Um, how we divided ourselves into different groups and uh, teams, uh, the logistics team, the needs assessment team, fundraising team, and so on, uh, which we will talk in detail. And um, maybe even the challenges that we shared. And also through this platform, we want to thank all our, our stakeholders, the people that we've worked with, the government officials, the medical officers, and also individuals uh, whom we had no idea would be needing their help. And um, we just want to send a thank you for to everyone actually for making this campaign successful. So I'll give the time to Lima now. She will be speaking more on the campaign. Thanks, Kekre, and thank you to the members of the press for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Uh, we are really grateful for this. Uh, though it was 11th hour, uh, we really wanted to make sure that as we close our campaign today, we want to make sure that um, the information goes to the public. Uh, just how blessed Naglan is to receive a lot of medical supplies from a lot of donors. So Help Naglan Breathe um, started, was started back in the month of May 2021. Uh, all the dates and stats are in the booklet, so yeah, you can just have a look whenever. Um, so Help Naglan Breed started uh, because of the situation that was in Naglan. Uh, a group of us, we got together, we were discussing about the situation in Naglan, and we thought, oh, can we do something? The government is doing a lot. Uh, we are, the churches are doing, communities are, are, are getting together to, to help uh, the patients and the health centers. And so we saw the opportunity that there were donors, international organizations, aid agencies, providing supplies. And, so th and we thought maybe we could connect them with the health centers back at home. And that's how we got together. Initially, it was just a couple of us, but then, uh, then we were very fortunate to receive the support of a lot of donors and a lot of medical aid started pouring in for, for Nagaland. So um, very briefly, we, uh, we so far we raised in that the campaign r ran for seven months from May to November. We had 45 plus volunteers, Nagas based in about seven countries. Uh, we worked in different time zones. All the project was done virtually. Um, all of our weekly meetings was done online, which was very fascinating. Um, and at the end of this campaign, we distributed medical supplies to all the district hospitals in Nagaland, including NHK and referral hospital. Um, we, raised, we distributed medical supplies worth 1.5 crore. We received financial aid 
about 25 lakhs. And we could do this because of the support of over 20 donors from India and overseas. And uh, we were also supported by the local government to transport some of the supplies. We had Pro Rural, which is a nonprofit based in Nagalen, who was our fiscal sponsor. So they helped us manage all the finances. We also had Youthnet, who helped us with the logistics. We needed warehouse in Kohima and Dimapur to keep the supplies. So storing our supplies was done at Pro Rural and Youthnet's office in Dimapur. So that is how we functioned. Um, we are really grateful to all the international donors as well as national donors uh, who kind of generously sup provided supplies to um, the state of Nagaland. We also uh, raised or started a Milap campaign, which is a fundraising campaign online, and we shared it to our friends in Nagaland, India, and around the world. And through that, we received so many um, generous donors coming online to support us via um, the Milap campaign. So through the humanitarian agencies and through our Milap fundraising campaign is how we raised um, all the donations for the 45 plus health centers in Nagaland. Um, so that is just very briefly about the work that we did. In terms of how much we supplied, where did the supplies go, we have like detailed drafts stats here in this report where we have highlighted. Uh, but then throughout last year's, from May until November when we functioned, we made sure that every time we were confirmed of a, a consignment of a donation, we put it up online. And then the tracking dates, everything was made up online. Uh, until they reach the beneficiary, all the information will be available in our website just to make sure that it is transparent. Um, How we were able to manage to carry out this campaign, although we were all in different places, although we weren't there physically together, how uh, the virtual platform had been able to connect us yeah. and um, uh, make this campaign successful. All, we obviously needed people at the ground for the logistics, but besides the groundwork, uh, the groundwork I think everything was carried out online and uh, through the Google Docs platform so everything was transparent and uh, everything was real time will you be willing to come together again and you know uh, start the campaign again you're asking the question right? you want an answer from us <laughs> It, it, this, this happened, Health Nagarin Breathe happened very organically, and I think if a third wave happened and if there is a burden amongst the members, I think some of us might want to continue, but it really depends on the circumstances. Because um, we never plan to make this a seventh month campaign. We never imagined we will get 20 plus donors yeah. uh, supporting us. Mm -hmm. So I think we feel very fortunate and blessed um, yeah. just to send all these supplies. But we are really hopeful that um, yeah. we will not face another pandemic like we did last year. I think uh, as a campaign, because we are not an established NGO, mm -hmm. we were just uh, coming together of friends. Uh, that I would like to call this, everyone, we are all friends now. Um, the biggest issue was uh, finding or building credibility. Because when we reach out to our donors, they don't know who we are. They don't know who the Help Nagarin Breed campaign are, although we may be very genuine. So I think uh, this trust building process was quite a challenging uh, experience for our fundraising team. And uh, I would like to <laughs> really commend them as well. And um, I think we're, we're, we're very overwhelmed, actually, um, by the generosity of our donors and by people uh, just receiving so much more than we had anticipated. Um, to be very honest, I think our target was maybe just to, I don't know how it started. Maybe we were like, okay, a few supplies, okay, 20 lakhs, 30 lakhs, and we were just very overwhelmed, actually, by the response, uh, by the generosity of like our well-wishers. So, we, yeah, we called this press conference to mm -hmm. just thank them. And also, yeah, we wanted to um, be transparent about um, our workings. Mm -hmm. So, Every item that we supplied <laughs> in terms of uh, 
the larger equipments like cylinders and concentrators was the, the whole idea was to allow people to start breathing again. Um, and, it, and I think it, there was like no, you know, brainstorming. We saw that cylinders were available. We saw that Naglin needed cylinders. We saw that Naglin needed concentrators, pulse oximeters. And so I think we spent like literally two minutes to decide the name, but it was thinking, yeah. I don't think we have like a very fancy uh, description of like why help Naglin <laughs> breathe. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think it's self-explanatory, I guess. <laughs> Um, so, we did not have like one, um, at different phases, it was like different. So there is a section called our priorities, um, and we have like six priority areas. And so maybe in, there was a time when Longleng was like very high in terms of positive rate, and also in terms of, uh, but then they were maybe sufficient with basic medical supplies. So how do we decide which, which district needs what? So we, we look at this. Um, maybe Noklak, Noklak is, took us about four days to send the supplies. So we took that into consideration. Or we spoke to the frontline workers, some of the medical doctors, and they said, okay, by next week we need at least this much PPE kits. So it was based on that. And in some cases, suddenly one week, and the cases showed up in some districts, like Kohima and Demap, where there was an urgency. So, and then population. So maybe one PHC covers so many populations. So maybe that is a requirement. Or our current supply data where we look at our warehouse and in our warehouse we have like this pulse oximeter, this many concentrators. So, so we had to link the health center with this requirement and what supplies we had. Because sometimes they would call us and they say, okay, we need co oxygen concentrators, but we don't have it in our warehouse. And so the fundraising team, we would start reaching out to donors for concentrators, and that's how it worked. We also had our own careers and studies, so it was very difficult to juggle, but our priority was to make sure um, us reaching out to them and asking them what they need, and then when they mentioned that, we would provide the supplies. So I don't think there is one district that is, stands out and says, oh, they need, I think all the health centers require a lot of um, support. Um, I think with regard to this, for us that we, our priority was uh, firefighting, right? So basically, emergency, according to the need, we would uh, supply the items. So for us also, it was not really like a thought, uh, thinking properly about, you know, next two, three months, what are we doing? But suddenly someone said, okay, things are needed here. So uh, that, I think for all of us, we met in the village, and we mostly, a, uh, you know, firefighting uh, group, uh, mostly a group that was based on emergency needs basis. So yeah, so some of the, supplies that went out here and there for people who really want to click on it might think that okay why there why there you know but uh, everything is based on the situation at that particular point in time uh, how did the team overcome this uh, uh, creativity uh, issues when it comes to approaching donors and uh, given the fact that you yourself say that since group is not a recognized NGO you know mm -hmm. so how did the, uh, the team overcome that Right. Uh, yes, that's a good question and a tough one. Um, I think initially uh, we had to use our individual credentials. So um, the core team members, we had to put our name out there and, and we were accountable for what we were proposing. Uh, we had done a thorough research of the healthcare infrastructure in Nagaland, and so we have the stats. Some of the numbers are open to the public domain, and some of them are not open to the public domain. Uh, but we, so we tried to find uh, the information of the current situation. We used that data in addition to um, the reports made by different news outlets as well as research institutes in the world. Uh, they were reporting on the projected number of cases in the Northeast, and so we used that data to develop a strong research proposal. Uh, the second thing we did was we collaborated with um, local NGOs um, to make sure that they were there to help us with anything finance related. We have our legal friend here. Uh, she handled all the MOUs with the organizations. So any kind of financial donation that we were supposed to, we were expecting, it came to the local nonprofit that we collaborated with. Um, simultaneously, we also reached out to the health department. We reached out to the DTF. 
we reached out to the Naglin COVID-19 war room team to understand the need and we told them if we need help in terms of logistics, will you be there? And they had given their word and we worked with them in certain instances to um, garner the support. So we made sure that it was not just us working, but we were working together with the community, with the local NGOs, with the local government because at the end for us it's not about oh we are trying to do something but this is a collective need and we want to make sure that the supplies reach the beneficiaries and so when you have those kind of um, legal contracts as well as um, word of affirmation from uh, the local authorities uh, it was easier for the donors to be convinced um, and to supply the donations uh, we were also present on social media. We had like a legit website um, with all the credentials. So we used those methods to make sure that we were not an anonymous hidden group, but uh, we had put ourselves out there through that. They're also all equally sailing on, on the same boat with the general citizens. But I think as each individual, what we need to do is be cautious about all the precautions that uh, the protocols and the protocols that has been laid down because fine two years and well, everyone is exhausted in, you know, finding, uh, uh, I mean, uh, following the guidelines, protocols, the do's and don'ts, but I, I think the, the only uh, way forward for now, till the pandemic persists, is for us to follow the safety measures and, of course, keep wearing the mask. I think that's just <laughs> oh, yeah. advice, yeah. Uh, <laughs> be vaccinated. Yes, <laughs> and also, yes, get vaccinated. I think there's been quite a queue and chaos also regarding the vaccination status here in Nagaland as well. So uh, I think vaccination is the only way out to be protected at this current stage. So that's also, yeah. Um, I, don't if, uh, I don't know if it's mentioned in the report, uh, but just before I forget, um, we also have a different, a second dimension to our campaign. We had a food relief uh, yeah. Work up program initiative as well. Yeah. So we did not just supply medical uh, uh, items, but we had also um, reached out, uh, provided food supplies to needy families mm -hmm. uh, through our partner NGOs, uh, through Youthnet and through Rural. And also, I think global we have global shapers as well, yeah. and uh, our independent uh, food relief program. Yes. Yeah. So maybe if you guys want to talk right. about So this. we had like different stages like what our colleague mentioned regarding um, our focus. So it was emergency relief. You know the basic structure of the group, the team, all the basic the structure. The structure, okay. So the structure is not here. All right. Is that the table? Um, it's in their booklet. <laughs> it's not in ours. So what we had was um, the first, not the first team, but we were divided into different groups. Um, we have the fundraising team where we were responsible to reach out to it's in the last page, um, the working structure. It's not. Blue. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Yeah, she has it here. So we have the fundraising team. Uh, the fundraising team was in charge of the Milab campaign, as well as reaching out to all the donors, humanitarian agencies, international organization. Uh, we had a lot of philanthropists who were also supporting us. Um, with this campaign. We have the administration basically coordinating all the, 40, all the different working groups, as well as the 45 volunteers, um, reaching out to the local government, reaching out to our partners, our supporters, etc. We have the legal team. The legal team was in charge of all the MOUs, just making sure that we were legally sound, that we were not crossing any wrong boundaries, both um, financially as well as in terms of our existing um, as a relief group. Uh, we had the finance team, our, our colleague Shiroi and Ari, they're not here, but they, made, they, were, they kept track of every single donation that came in, as well as all the expenses. So they, were, they spearheaded the uh, finance. We have the supply chain management, and under that we have the logistics, we have the groundwork. I think Kekre and Japu can explain. Also, um, just making sure that the, how to uh, transport the supplies from Punjab, Delhi, Mumbai to Nagaland. The greatest challenge was from Kohima Dimapur sending it to the districts. Yeah. That was a nightmare. I don't know how they handled it, but they did somehow. Um, we required a lot of manual, like human resource for that. Um, we also had the procurement committee. And, and so for financial donations that came from overseas, we had to use a different protocol, a different method. 
and so it was very uh, long, lengthy process. Uh, procurement was handled by Jaku and his team. Um, and then we had the digital communications team and the needs assessment. Uh, this team oversaw the research work that we had to do, just making sure that we had the data, we knew which health center in Nagaland needed what at what time, just making sure that we kept track of the positivity rates, uh, we made sure that we were in touch with the frontline workers, the stories, uh, because even for donors, they need to know what is happening in Nagaland. They need to know what is happening in a particular health center. And so we need real-time data. And so for that, we had a large pool of individuals working in the needs assessment team as well as in the digital communications. And some of the stories, we shared it online on our Instagram page, uh, but mostly we use it to reach out to our donors and say, okay, this is the situation in Nagaland, and so we need your help. And that is how we kind of did the work. Um, this was not planned, and this is not the best structure, but we are sharing this, and we will also be developing a, a report so that other voluntary groups can also see how we function, and maybe they can learn from this, and they can maybe adapt, maybe develop it better, and then do more work. So maybe tomorrow we will see not just HNB, but more, more than one health Nagland breed, or more than one COVID relief group. Um, but of course, I'm not negating what we have right now. I think so many communities, individuals are coming together, and this is just one of the entities working in Nagaland right now. Uh, not right now. I think um, since COVID started, a lot of um, it was there was an ease in terms of transactions. But we have to also understand that India's FCRA policies have been changed, and there were some kind of issues. But so far, um, with 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 H and B, we have had no issues. Also, I have to point out that. We received 25 lakhs in cash donations, but then a lot of our supplies were medical goods. So uh, we didn't have to deal with a lot of financial transactions. Do you think uh, recently uh, act, uh, Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, like, will it affect the future groups in Jews for willing to take up such works? If they are relying on foreign funding, if they don't have an FCRA, that will be a problem, yes. Um, if there are restrictions from the government of India, then yes, they will not be able to receive foreign funding. Yeah, no, so in April, we kind of launched, but work started in May. Yeah, so HNB, the name, and like just the trends coming together, we got together in the month of April. I think yeah, just organizing ourselves was a challenge in itself, just yeah. coming up with different teams and different leads and who's mm -hmm. supposed to do what. Like, uh, I don't think we borrowed any of the structure from any campaign or anything. I think we had developed as the challenge came along. So, um, so I improve upon this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I think the organization process was uh, a challenge in itself. So probably it's why it took uh, uh, some time for us to actually start kicking off with the groundwork. People come together and, um, and they just give without expecting anything in return. So um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. We're all doing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> a takeaway for me would be um, how you know to affect change, or you know, if you want to make a difference, it all needs all it needs is uh, a group of people with similar passions and similar intentions. It can be like Lima had already mentioned. They were all different personalities. We were all different. We were all uh, from various places, but we all had a common sort of goal during the second wave. The, the goal and the passion was that we wanted to help people. And uh, there were difficulties, there were you know, uh, struggles here and there. But since all of us were in the campaign with, the, with one goal and with one uh, passion, kind of made things easier. So uh, the takeaway for me would be that 
and whatever, whatever in your life, whatever happens, if you want to affect change in Nagaland or wherever, all it needs is a group of individuals who have similar, you know, one, one goal. Mm -hmm. And if everyone is invested in that goal, it's not really difficult to get things done. And yeah. along the way, of course, you need help from people. And like they already mentioned, we had a lot of donors, overwhelming donors who give a lot. So uh, really helped us in uh, achieving our success. So yeah, that's the takeaway I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the unique things about this campaign was that we really, our needs assessment team really worked hard to get the ground realities of what was really happening. So I think that was one of the reasons uh, we were as effective as we were able to. And uh, I think that's what set us apart from other relief campaigns, I think, it's on, a, on a personal note. So uh, yeah, I think that's all I have yeah. to say on that.